to the second day of our uh, our Ponars Bear Conference. We have two amazing panels for you today. I will be your moderator for both of them. We're going to keep it uh, uh, keep it with a good, exciting, vibrant discussion. Uh, and uh, our first panel, our first panel today is on the Baltics and Moldova. Uh, so we've got uh, we've got three great discussion papers for you. The first one uh, by Juju Tiergu and Christina Kalas, second by Joan de Bardeleven. She'll be coming to us virtually from, uh, from Canada. Um, and the final one by Magdalena Dembinska. Uh, and then we will have Henry Hale as our discussant. So 10 minutes for presentations, 10 minutes for our discussant, and then we'll open it up to the audience and, and have at it. So. Uh, Zhuzha and Christina, the floor is yours. So, uh, good morning. Uh, me and Zhuzha and Tamas Kish from uh, Romania have been working on the a research paper as part of the Bear Network uh, that focuses on the question of the king state relationship of the minorities in Central Eastern Europe. With our, we have kind of two regional focuses, which are very uh, standard traditional focuses in academia. One is Hungary as a king state, the other one as Russia. And this uh, policy paper is part of that work, but it focuses exclusively on Russia as a king state. And our original research was uh, mainly focused around the question of securitization of the Russophone populations of the Baltic states. Um, as you know, in this famous, this, are, this is the wrong slide, sorry. <laughs> yes, sorry. Uh, as a famous triadic nexus between the, the minority, the home country or the nation state and the historical homeland, um, uh, in this case, Russia. So we know that this is a kind of a geopolitical nexus. We know that these relationships are securitized, especially the relationship between the, the minority and the home country or the host country of that minority. Uh, and our original research question focused on how much the securitization has changed since 2014, when clearly the, the historical homeland, in this case, Russia, has uh, taken a specific steps on geopolitical arena and how that has affected uh, the Russophone minorities in Estonia and Latvia in terms of the securitization of the relations with the, with the home country, but also their own agency, their own ability to act uh, as a result of that or to behave and, and to, to put forward the political demands. But of course, uh, and, and why did we choose Estonia and Latvia? It's understandable there is a sizable uh, part of the Russian minority. Lithuania is also in the picture, but today I'm not uh, focusing on Lithuania. And our hypothesis was that 2014 was an important turning point in where the securitization of this minority became even more um, uh, higher in those, in those two countries and how that affected actually the minority agency. Uh, Estonia and Latvia are comparable countries when it comes to the history, when it comes to the history of the Rus Russian-speaking minority. However, um, uh, our research uh, uh, starting from 2014 shows that the securitization of the minority in Estonia and Latvia have been to some extent different. Uh, in the, I, I'm not going to go deep into that. It's, it's going to be in our paper. Um, the securitization of the minority in Latvia is much stronger in politics than it is in Estonia, and that also hampers very strongly the minority agency of the Russian-speaking population in Latvia compared to that of Estonia. So uh, simply put it in simply, minority, Russian minority in Estonia has more playing ground in putting forward its minority demands, whether this is education or citizenship or the linguistic rights, while in Latvia, in much stronger and higher securitized situation, these demands are much more difficult to, to, to put on the political agenda. It's immediately becomes a question of state security and it's immediately becomes um, off the table, you know, put off the table. Now, um, 24th of February, 2022 uh, happened and we have to refocus a little bit of our research question. Um, 
we are still focusing on securitization. And obviously, this is still important to ask uh, how securitized or how this Russian aggression towards Ukraine has affected the, the question of securitization of the Russian speaking minority in Estonia and Latvia. Um, but the second question that we became very interested in is what about the relationship between the Russian speaking minority and the historical homeland, that is Russia? Uh, what happens there uh, as a result of uh, Russia's aggression towards Ukraine? And uh, so we developed uh, uh, the hypothesis, uh, the one uh, relations between King State and the minority are changing and the distancing is happening. Uh, so the, the Russian aggression towards Ukraine has caused a distancing happening. And the second hypothesis is that, however, the democratic agency of the minority is decreasing in the situation of the war, even further decreasing compared to what it was before. So we set ourselves to go and have a look um, at uh, the um, this hypothesis. As you understand, the, the, you know, this is two month old situation. So there is no research done on, on, on those hypotheses. So what we did, we went uh, through the media uh, reporting. We went to see what the Russian speaking minority has done or said in public in those countries since 24th of February. We looked at the national level leaders of the minority, but also on a local level and, 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 and um, so to say, really meso level leaders, what they have uh, said regarding the Russian aggression. Um, I also did two interviews over the phone with, um, with two representatives of the Russian speaking minority from Latvia, but being myself from Estonia, I, I have maybe better understanding what's going on in Estonia, but not definitely in Latvia. So this is a very quick, just a week, not even a research, just a, a quick look at what is going on in those countries. And um, basically, um, the relationship on the national level, the Russian leaders or the Russian speaking leaders on a national level, uh, there have been a kind of unanimous voice condemning and in very severe words condemning the Russian aggression towards Ukraine. With the one exception in Latvia, which is Tatiana Zdanoka, who is a member of the European Parliament um, representing uh, Russian Union in Latvia, all other top Russian speaking political leaders of Latvia and Estonia have been very clear uh, about their um, attitude and opinion regarding what happened on the 24th of February. And I think the most notorious, um, and I wanted to show to you here, is the change of sort of, a, uh, not a change of mind, but the change of political position of a former mayor of Riga, who is now a member of European Parliament, but he's also under the criminal investigation in Latvia, Nils Ushakov. Uh, he used to be the main organizer of 9th of May Victory Day celebrations in Latvia. He has been the one um, celebrating and organizing this, which is very different from Estonian context, because in Estonia, not a single Russian politician dared to be the main organizer of the event. They were kind of participating, but the organization was always presented as a grassroots initiative. So politicians never took a clear position in, in organizing. Ushakov, differently, as a mayor of Riga, was a main organizer of, of those events. And this is 2019. And then in 2022, he, he said very clearly, no 9th of May celebrations whatsoever. Anybody who does that next to the Victory uh, Monument is actually supporting Russian aggression in Ukraine. So he was very clear on that, which was a, kind of a biggest signal a main signal to the Russian speaking population that the leaders have take, taken a very clear um, stance. Um, Shakovs has been also uh, making very clear statements and, and speeches on the plenary session in European Parliament on the March 1st, um, we, who, where he said that um, he called the Kremlin's lowly and criminal war against Ukraine and emphasizing that we are against the Kremlin with all our power. However, we are not against the Russian people. So he was trying to make a difference between the regime and the people. Also, uh, Russian speakers of Latvia, some very prominent uh, journalists and, and cultural leaders uh, published an open letter about the war on April the 8th, calling on Russian aggression, Russia, calling Russia as an aggressor state and stating a very clear stance on the war where they, and I'm quoting, we are ashamed that orders to kill, rape, and torture are given in our language. The war in Ukraine has changed the meaning of what it means to belong to Russian culture. 
we call on those who celebrate May 9th to realize that participating in the celebrations in Victory Park this year means supporting the war that is going on now. We ask you, do not arrange a celebration while innocent people are being tortured and killed every day in Ukraine. Remember the loss of your family, but respect the pain of others. So there's a very clear um, statement. I think there is no uh, um, question regarding where the position of the leaders, uh, cultural media leaders, political leaders of the Russian speakers in Latvia stand. It's quite similar in Estonia. I'm not gonna start quoting Estonian political leaders, but Jan Atom, uh, the member of European parliament, most prominent Russian leader in Estonia, or Heikelbar, who is the mayor of Tallinn, and most prominent Russian leader, they have been very clear on, on calling it Russian aggression and, and uh, demanding also uh, asking for the Russian population not to support and not to celebrate the 9th of May the way they used to do it in, in, in the past. However, um, uh, the question is, okay, this is a top political leadership saying that, so what do the, the population actually, how the population relates to that? We don't have much information because uh, I know that in Estonia, the surveys have been done, but they are secret and even were not shared with me. So the, the government strategic bureau is doing the opinion polls, but they are not shared with the public. Uh, however, Latvian uh, opinion polls were shared with the public. And uh, when I, uh, I will show you the Latvian opinion polls of the population. Here they are, it's in Latvian, but the translation, the question is, Speaking of hostilities, when in 24th of February, the Russian Federation Army crossed the Ukrainian border and started an invasion and committed war crimes. However, according to the president of Russian Federation, Vladimir Putin, parts of Russian army are actually conducting a military operation. What is your opinion? Which parties of the war do you support in this conflict? And you have, um, this is a Latvian speaking part of the population opinions, and this is a Russian speaking part of, of, of population opinions. Yellow means I'm supporting Ukraine. Uh, um, uh, red means that I'm supporting Russia in this conflict. And the gray means I don't know. And uh, the orange means that I don't, I, I, I don't support either of them. So. And as you know, in Latvian part of the population, Latvian speaking part of the population, very clearly a strong support for uh, Ukraine, while the Russian speaking population is much more divided on that issue. You have 20% of the Russian speakers in Latvia saying that they support Russia in that conflict. 25% uh, support Ukraine, which is still more than the ones supporting Russia. So, and 46% say that they don't know they're not saying that they don't take either side, they just don't want to disclose their opinion on, on, on that matter. So what can you read from this? One thing, of course, the situation is securitized for the minority. They are afraid or not willing to expose their, or, or their opinion about that situation. But when I called this Latvian journalist, Russian speaking journalist, and asked him, how would you interpret this 46% of respondents? He said that there is an interesting process going on among the Russian speakers in Latvia, which he said, it actually sounds better in Russian than, than in English, but basically he said, uh, you can't love Russia anymore, but you don't know how to love Ukraine yet. So, uh, so this, is, this is how he explained saying that, okay, relationship with Russia are now complicated and I, you, you can't express support for that because this is inhuman what's going on. Clearly, if you have any humanity in your mind, you just can't support it. But by, by saying that to take Ukrainian side in this war is also difficult because Ukraine as a country has been through the Russian propaganda portrayed as fascist nationalists, uh, hating Russian culture, killing Russian language. So basically against you. And I think this is the difficulty of Russians to actually make very clear statement that, that Yes, I support Ukraine. So what he said, what instead is happening is that they try not to take political position regarding the war, but they are extremely active in humanitarian side of that, meaning that receiving refugees, doing the humanitarian work on the ground in Latvia. So you can see a lot of Russian speakers being very, very active in, in, in support of the Ukrainian refugees. And I think it's the same in Estonia. I mean, the opinion polls pretty much would show you the same results, I'm pretty much sure, as, as they do in Latvia. 
on the humanitarian on the humanitarian ground, the action is, is quite strong. So there is there is a strong support. There are both part of the Russian speaking population in both countries who are against the Ukrainian refugees, but I would dare to claim that that's still a significant minority compared to the, the bigger part of the, of the Russian population. So this is the um, the thing, and um, uh, uh, Martin Schkaprans, who is a University of Latvia researcher in political science, he said that uh, over the time, compared to 2014, the support for Russia when it comes to the question of military activity in Ukraine has significantly decreased in Latvia among the Russian speakers. In 2014, 65, as much as 65% of the Russian speakers in Latvia approved military action in Ukraine, meaning the annexation of Crimea and, and um, the questions in Donbass. So 65% thought that Russia is doing the right thing and they are behind Russia. So we are down to 20% uh, now. So there's a, there's a quite a significant change over the last eight years. And of course, while a minority of Latvian Russian speakers do support Putin's war, the public space has been strongly dominated by those who condemn it. So um, that's also very clear. In Estonia, the situation is similar. However, however, um, publicly, the, the, the public demand for the Russian, from the Estonian side, for the Russians to take a very uh, public position has been much less, um, how to say, uh, much less demand is put on Russians to, to stand up publicly for that than in Latvia. So in Latvia, the securitization is much higher in that sense. While the minor, question of the minority agency, how much the minorities in this kind of situation can actually still continue putting forward their own demands, meaning, for example, demanding the citizenship rights or demanding that Russian language should be the main language of education for them. And you understand that this is a very heightened securitization situation right now. Uh, these voices are silenced completely. So they are not on the agenda, and I know that the Russians not dare to, to put it on the agenda. So the, the, uh, the meso-level actors, that's local actors, the, the, the teach directors of the schools, the local leaders, they are rather quiet. They, they are not really actively taking many positions. And uh, my last uh, comment, I talked to one journalist in Narva who, about this minority agency, and he said very interestingly to me, he said, while for Tallinn, it seems that the issue of citizenship and language have been solved by now. So we are not even discussing it anymore. This issue is finished. We know that there, you know, the Estonian language will be dominating the education system, so there is no discussion. For people here in Narva, these are not finished questions, but we are, these are not the questions that we can ask right now uh, in Estonian politics. And um, so that's, that's very, um, Good quote for you to understand how the meso level minority agencies is basically non, not working right now in this kind of situation of the war. So, as a conclusion, I would say that it's a bit too early to say how the relations between Russophones and Russia evolve um, because this is a process still going on. However, the first signs to indicate to further um, a political, political alienation from Russia. Uh, that's for sure. We don't know about the cultural uh, questions yet because these cannot be captured with these kind of questions. So we, we, there's still a question of a cultural connection and identity-wise connection to Russia. The heightened securitization impacts definitely the minority agency in those countries, and the minority agency is um, the, the shadow of the war that increases the securitization levels can stifle democratic debate about the issues of higher concern for the minority, such as citizenship and uh, language issues. And uh, definitely minority members need uh, active support to sustain interest in, in, in this kind of democratic participation, because if your issues are not on the agenda and they are kind of off the table, then, then your participation levels in politics are becoming decreasing. And that's the, that's the estimates that political scientists say that in, in upcoming elections in Latvia, in, in autumn this year, and in Estonia spring next year, the participation of Russian minority in elections will be extremely low, just exactly because the minority agency is very curtailed in the current situation of war. Thank you. Thank you. Now we're going to go virtual. So Sarah, can you help pull up uh, pull up Joan? We've got Joan de Barleben of Carleton University, uh, whose policy brief is on Russian media depictions of EU-Russia cross-border initiatives in the Baltics. And Joan, 
Can you hear us? I can hear you, but I can still see the PowerPoint screen. Can you see me? No, we can't see you quite yet. Give it a moment. Sarah is working her magic. <laughs> I'm patient. It all worked yesterday. Joan, do you have a PowerPoint? I do, yeah. Okay, so we need to wait for you. I sent it. Um, um, I think Sarah has it. Oh, Sarah has everything, yeah. It's nice to be here with all of you. I can't see you yet, but. Uh, we can hear you well. We can, we can. We can hear you quite well. Yeah, well, uh, I can always just speak if the video doesn't work. That's all right, too. It's not a problem. Okay, we'll give it, we'll give it a minute. PowerPoint is not that critical, so it'll be fine either way. You could be, you can be a, a disembodied voice coming to us from the heavens. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, there we go. There we go. We see Hello, you. everybody. <laughs> nice to see you. Just try to get my camera set up. <laughs> <laughs> One moment. Can only have one or the other. <laughs> Could you try saying something now, please, Jane? Yes. Hello. Can you hear me now? Yes. All right. Sorry about that, everyone. Okay, good. Um, I'm going to talk, as, as Julia mentioned, about cross-border cooperation initiatives. And these are initiatives supported by the EU under its um, European Neighborhood Instrument. And they've had policies in place between the three Baltic states and Poland and Russia, as well as a variety of other ones um, in the period after 2014. So this was one of the, one of the things that was not cut off when the, when the relations were frozen after 2014, which makes it really interesting to look at. The purpose was picking up on some of the work that um, actually Magdalena Dembinska and Friedrich Morant have been doing, is to try to, was to try to see to what extent the local level was impacted by the geopolitical conflict. Um, the project's been interrupted twice now, which has created a problem because obviously cross-border initiatives were affected by the pandemic. And that's kind of a, something going on behind the scenes, which is not very evident in the research material that I've gathered, but obviously it had an impact because person-to-person -person contact could not occur to any extent. And then just as I was had delayed my interviews until this winter, actually after January, um, the war started. So the interviews became impossible. So I tried, I substituted this temporarily at least for some media analysis on the Russian side to try to see at least on the Russian side how these projects were being depicted. Um, the projects were suspended in March 2022 by the European Union. Um, this is part of the, the, the project agreement. The projects themselves continue on the Baltic and Polish sides. So the funding can be used by the EU side partners, but it can't be provided to the Russian side and no activities with the Russian side are permitted. So most of these projects, although they were in the 2014 to 2020 EU budget period, um, they are still continuing. There are very few of them that have been completed. There, there's a, you know, a handful in each country that have been completed, but most of them are ongoing and they wouldn't be completed until the end of 2022, which is part of the reason also why I delayed my interviews because I thought it would be better to perhaps wait till after the pandemic uh, calmed down and the actually they were closer to project completion. I'm regretting that decision now though, actually, because I can't do the interviews. So the, the, I'm kind of seeking also some input here on how to proceed with this because obviously things have changed, but I just wanna talk a little bit about these projects and the significance of what we found in the media analysis. So the interesting thing, I'll put, try to put up my PowerPoint slide, although I don't see where I can do it here. I don't see on the bottom where I can do it. Um, it doesn't, I don't seem to have that button. Oh yeah, I do have that button. I apologize, I found it. So let's see if I can find it. Okay, can you see that now? 
I, I'm just wondering if people can see the slide or not. Do you see project characteristics? Yeah, you can see that? Okay, I'm assuming you can see it. Um, so these, this describes the project characteristics and you can see there's small, relatively small amount of funding. There's an EU contribution, there's a Russian contribution, and there also in some cases are member state contributions, especially from Estonia and some um, co-financing, which I didn't put in there because it's a little bit blurry in the cases of, of Latvia, Lithuania, and Poland, how those actual contributions work. Um, the Estonian contribution is quite substantial, around 9 million euros. And the Russian uh, regions that are involved are described there. You can see there the adjacent region, regions. So for Lithuania and Poland, it's only Kaliningrad Oblast, whereas for Estonia and Latvia, Pskov is a really important partner, um, as well as, of course, for Estonia, St. Petersburg, Leningrad, Oblast, and also to a certain degree for Latvia. So those are the project characteristics. And these, this is, um, whoops, I should have this on the slideshow. On the current slide, okay. That might enable you to see it a little bit better. And this shows the type of projects. So one of the things about this is many of these projects are very technical. I think it's safe to say that they're all non-political. There's not, the, there are only two projects in this whole group and they're in Lithuania that have any kind of, you know, vaguely um, political implication. One has to do with e-democracy e and the other has to do with relations between the re local governments and, and civic organizations. Even the ones here that are under this category of local and regional governance are not really like about that in the sense we would normally understand it, except those two Lithuanian ones. They're more dealing with the capacity of local governments to deal with particular policy issues, which might be health issues or some other, you know, more tech, I, I guess I shouldn't call it technical, but sectoral um, focus. So you get an idea from, from this list of the types of projects and they're heavily, heavily focused, I'd say, in these three areas, business, small business, um, entrepreneurship, environment, and down here, the local cultural heritage and, and tourism. So from looking at that, um, you can see that it's unlikely the politicals going to enter. But one of the interesting things about the way these projects is, are run is that they're very um, much focused on partnership. And so you, you actually have um, the, the program guidelines being developed jointly with the Russian side. And you have the adjudication of the proposals being adjudicated with the Russian side. So I think that the continuation after 2014 was based on, I would say, I mean, this is my interpretation, three kind of main rationales that I would see the benefits continuing after 2014. The people to people contact, which the EU of course is very big on, um, the concrete effects for the local populations, because these affect things like water quality, healthcare, um, not only tourism and, and business development, but they're very concrete benefits that accrue to both sides of the border, including, of course, the EU side. And third, a kind of unspoken or unmentioned advantage, which is a kind of rule of law advantage, because it brings very much the Russian partners into the regulate, regulatory liberal democracy format, I call it, of the EU, of a kind of rule-based um, adjudication process. Everything is very you know, regulated within a rule of law context. So I presume that was the reason, these were the reasons they were continued. Now, so we look at the um, media analysis, and this is only up through the period of sort of August 2014. And we analyzed with my research assistant, um, actually 93 articles, which were derived from a search on Integrum database, as well as a general, a general um, web search of other sources that might not be indexed in Integrum. And it was based on, examination of particularly 25 of the projects, which I deemed either to be more likely to have some kind of political you know, tinge or a little bit of a focus on environment just to get a thematic focus. Other cases um, where there were joint um, objects of cooperation and a, a little bit more emphasis overall in the governance category. 
So we found um, 93 articles only. So the, the conclusion is that this is a pretty uninteresting set of media <laughs> depictions, quite frankly. They're very descriptive. They're mainly short articles that describe the project content. Um, there's no mention of a political element in any of them. There is, there, they have a very positive slant. Only 19% mention EU funding and only 34% mention the EU overall. So um, it's a kind of, I would call sterilized version of these projects in that they don't really contextualize them. I mean, there's, there's an element of, yes, it's great to have cooperation with these organizations and on these topics, but it's definitely not placed in the larger geopolitical context, either in a negative or a positive sense. So there are no geopolitical problems mentioned there. There's no idea that, okay, look at great. Isn't it great we're still cooperating with the EU here kind of thing. That's not there either. Um, two thirds of them only describe benefits on the Russian side. And as I said, 94% of them don't mention any problems at all. And that those that do mention problems, they're very gar garden variety, things like you know maybe some visa questions or funding issues, um, but nothing you know, beyond that. In fact, you, you'd expect there are a lot more problems like that, there've got to be, and yet they aren't really, they aren't really discussed. So they're pretty, you know, kind of flat <laughs> set of, of articles, I would say. So the conclusions I, I draw from that first is that um, the larger impact of these projects, although very significant on the beneficiaries and significant in a kind of technical infrastructural sense, for example, if water quality systems are improved, the, the kind of more um, ideational impact is probably fairly small, except unless there's an accelerator effect from direct contact with project participants of larger parts of the public, but they certainly aren't getting prominence in terms of, of the visibility on the Russian side. I'd really be curious to be able to go and look at them to see if the EU visibility, any you know, signs are there like on the Western side, but I very much doubt it. Um, However, the impact could be very significant in terms of quality of life in some cases. I don't know the last time when I was in Pskov, it was, it was before 2014, but you know, the water, you couldn't drink the water and people were even boiling, using bottled water to boil for their coffee or tea. So, I mean, improving water quality is like really a big impact. And um, so the suspension really indicates the, the kind of thing that, you know, of course, it's obvious why this had to be suspended. But on the other hand, it really, it really indicates the cost of this isolation of Russia. Because these are projects that in no way had a political, you know, a direct political significance or were being put forth as having any kind of relationship to the geopolitical conflict. And yet they have been directly affected. And this opportunity for some kind of lower level contact, which at least in the longer term, I suppose could build mutual understanding or some kind of human element into the relationship is of course now removed. And um, I'm not suggesting that the suspension should not have occurred, but it does put a sharp point on the difficulty of figuring out how, how things can move forward um, in terms of just creating any kind of basis for a positive interaction when, when the geopolitical level has now gone from having no, almost no impact to having a cataclysmic impact, you might say, on this effort at cross-border cooperation. So I'll stop there. I'll appreciate any comments you might have on how I might proceed with this. My, my intention is to do interviews on the uh, EU side. And I... I, I might also do a, a kind of more general survey of the, the, project, um, the project partners on the EU side, but of course that won't give me too much insight into what's happening on the Russian side in terms of how this is viewed, how this is actually viewed by the people who are, who are participating in those projects. So thank you very much. Thank you, Joe. We'll continue our Canadian dominance here, uh, Magdalena de Minsta. <laughs> Are you okay? Yeah. <laughs> uh, the long suffering. The long suffering, suffering my <laughs> head is suffering yes. for some time now. Anyway, uh, good. So when I, uh, when I first uh, 
proposed something to the program. I was uh, going to talk about my research on Abkhazia and, and Transnistria and the relations with the Russia, patron client relations. Then the war started. So I wanted to present something on the Eurasian de facto states uh, and their position to the, war, uh, to, the, to the war in Ukraine. And then uh, Moldova was put on the map by the, by the war. So the brief is actually on Moldova and Transnistria uh, and their position on, on the war. And um, what is puzzling actually um, is that um, while Abkhazia and South Ossetia, so the de facto states in, in, in Georgia, uh, from the beginning immediately recognized uh, Donetsk and Luhansk on 21st of February, when Moscow recognized both, both, uh, these, uh, these uh, autoproclaimed, self-proclaimed republics. Uh, and then Abkhazia and South Ossetia also um, supported the war in Ukraine, the invasion, and adopted a narrative that is completely, completely copy and paste from, from Russian, uh, Russian um, uh, narrative. Transnistria did not, did not recognize the Donetsk and Luhansk and did not adopt uh, such a narrative, did not support officially uh, Moscow, even though till now, it was also always backing Moscow for the recognition of South Ossetia and Abkhazia in 2008, for the recognition of the annexation of Crimea in 2014, and even in 2014, after the annexation of, of, of Crimea, um, Tiraspol uh, took that opportunity to ask Russia for annexation too. So, so something, something uh, changed here. Um, and so uh, on the one side, you have, you have um, uh, Transnistria that reiterates uh, its stance for independence, but does not support uh, Moscow. And at the same time, you have Kishnau, Moldova, that is applying for the Moldovan EU membership, is, uh, is certainly um, condemning the, the war on Ukraine, but refrains from joining Western sanctions on Russia. So the brief actually is, uh, what I try to do is to explain why uh, these ambiguities, if one might, might say. So for Transnistria, one big probably uh, explanation is its demography. So 26% of, of uh, Transnistrians are actually ethnic Ukrainians. So there's a lot of family ties with, with Ukraine, a lot of uh, social, uh, social and business relations, etc. And, and from the beginning, Transnistria opened its doors for, for Ukrainian refugees, and uh, there's uh, some 8,000 uh, people that actually want to stay in Transnistria, Ukrainians that want to stay in, in Transnistria, probably because of this family, uh, family ties. Um, but at the same time, I would argue that the, um, the, the, the stance that Transnistria has now towards the war is not only based on these demographic uh, explanations, but also because of the local uh, interests. Uh, so uh, what one uh, should know is that uh, Transnistria is actually, the exports from Transnistria are going mostly to, uh, to, to Europe, to European Union, 38%. Uh, of, of exports from Transnistria go to the European Union, uh, some 35% to Moldova, 14% to Ukraine, and only 9% uh, of Transnistrian exports go to actually to Eurasian Union. So, so you have this shift that, that, uh, that uh, shift of trade that, uh, that was operated after actually after Moldova signed the, uh, the CFTA, the deep and comprehensive uh, trade, uh, free trade uh, agreement with European Union. So you can imagine that the businesses, the companies in Transnistria, take advantage. They, they register in Kishnau, and then they sell. Uh, they they take advantage of of uh, the um, of of, uh, of what is offered to Moldova uh, to um, on on international markets. And this is done also, the, the, how they profit is that uh, these companies that export from Transnistria to uh, the European Union and to the West are actually benefiting from, uh, from the, uh, the gas that is provided by Russia free of charge. 
So they're really, the products are quite competitive on the European market. So they benefit from this situation on being in between Russia, depending on Russia for, for gas, etc., but at the same time selling and exporting to, uh, to, to the West. So there's a huge, um, huge actually debt that is created for gas. Uh, uh, by Transnistria, but Transnistria is certainly profit, profiting that. And who is profiting? So economic elites in, in Transnistria. These economic, uh, these economic elites, as you may know, captured the de facto states. They, they, are, they, are, they have the monopoly on not only economy, but also power. And they benefit from this unrecognized situation uh, and being in between. Uh, as, as a de facto state. So they navigate in between this, uh, in, in this situation and fear that the war will come and the war will, uh, uh, will just blow up what they constructed as self-interests within Transnistria. And, and this balancing act is also, um, well, we can also observe the same, not the same thing, but, uh, but the same navigating uh, on the part of Kishnau. So Kishnau is also now exporting and having business and trade mostly with Europe, but is also uh, heavily dependent on, on, on Russian energy, 100% for gas and 80% for electricity. And which is, which is interesting, maybe this is something that is not really uh, put in the media, but, but there's a real, um, a real possibility of a major energy crisis in Moldova right now, because there are two contracts that are, that are ending as of the end of April. One contract is with the Gazprom. So Gazprom is probably, maybe, and now we know that it does it with Bulgaria and Poland. So it might be that the gas to Moldova will be cut as of 1st of May. Uh, and also the contract for electricity that is produced in Transnistria, so 80% of, uh, of the consumption of electricity in Moldova is produced in Transnistria, in Kuchurgan. And the, the, uh, who owns the company? Uh, Russian, uh, Russian enterprise that is uh, related to Moscow owns the company of, uh, in Kuchurgan, the electricity company. And the, uh, the contract is ending April 31st. So, so you have this uh, dependency on Russia, but at the same time, this uh, the energy sector is intertwined within Transnistria too. So this, these relations are really important for to understand how what, what Moldova wants and what what is her autonomy or the marche de manoeuvre. Yeah. Um, so and on the other side, so Moldova is facing probably an energy crisis. At the same time, it is the poorest country in in Europe and is facing also the refugee, uh, incoming refugees. It is really, uh, you have uh, for a population of 3.5 million people, you have already uh, 430,000 people coming in, transiting, and over 100,000 staying in, in Moldova. Consumer prices went up and uh, inflation is uh, skyrocketing. Um, all that to say uh, that Moldova actually really needs uh, really needs um, some help and support, etc. And not only to survive, but uh, and to cope with the crisis, but also to if we want to support uh, the European turn of Moldova, um, uh, it's it, the the, pop the popularity of the European Union might be fragilized by this crisis. Uh, and why I say so, say so because since, since, um, since, uh, since decades, uh, the Moldovan society is divided on the issue of joining the EU or joining the European, uh, the Eurasian Union. So for example, uh, the, the last polls, uh, the polls that were um, uh, done in fall 2021, you had on, only probably we can say 38 percent of uh, Moldovan that strongly supported the country's EU membership and 26 somewhat so uh, and at the same time you had 22 percent of the population that supported strongly uh, the Eurasian Union 
and 27% somewhat, some, somehow, yes. In March 2022, there was a poll, there was different polls, and it's, um, well, we, we talked about the polls during the war and how, how and we can rely on them. And there's a lot of, uh, in Moldova, it's a specific maybe case, there's a lot of polls that's going, that, that were mediated, uh, and a lot of specialists say that, whoa, don't take, don't take credit with them. Um, but uh, in March 2002, the majority of, of Moldovans supported Ukraine, but still there was a huge chunk of the population, 20-26%, that uh, considered that the special operation is legitimate uh, in Ukraine. So, uh, and this, the, the opposition to Maya Sandu, the, the pro-European uh, president that uh, won elections in 2020, um, her opposition or the socialists that were led by former president, pro-Russia resident, uh, president Igor Dodon. And he uh, actually, even after Bucha and even after all the atrocities that, that we've seen, um, still was uh, advocating close ties with Moscow and uh, even met with the ambassador of Russia in Kishinev to that effect. Um, and he is the second best trusted politician in Moldova. Uh, so, um, so this is a different situation probably than, than elsewhere, but the, 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 the pro-European stance of the government is really, they really want to do that, but the situation because of the crisis uh, and the economic and social economic crisis, and because of the division of the society that, that still uh, is there um, might be something that we should we should probably look into with more care. And the St. George Ribbon, that's another issue that is really divisive in, in Moldova. Moldova banned ban the, uh, the, uh, the symbols, the V and Z, and the St. George, uh, George um, the Ribbon uh, and that provoke uh, a lot of debates and discussions. It's not unanimous within the society. So we'll see what's happened on May 9. Uh, and May 9 was addressed since we actually invited Moldovans to, oh, okay, come to Chaspol to celebrate May 9th. You can wear ribbons and whatever you wish. But now it cancels the celebrations because of the bombings that were that, that a few days ago. Uh, happened also, so I can stay over there. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Henry, what do you have to say? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I think the most important thing to say is that I really I enjoyed all three of the, the briefs, reading them, uh, learned a lot. Um, and so it was an interesting invitation to think about some of these places and, and countries that I haven't thought about as much uh, in recent weeks. Um, so I guess just as kind of discuss it, um, one of the things that I wanted to do is maybe to frame um, some general questions for discussion that I think all the, the, the uh, presentations speak to to some degree. Um, and one of the things that I see sort of emerging out of all of them here um, there seems to be a theme, so I'd be interested in the degree to which people agree with me it's a theme, <laughs> maybe not, um, is how um, the radical uh, scaling up of the war uh, is making, in general, strategies of political ambiguity uh, in, in, in this realm of international relations harder to sustain. Um, and also, you know, the, the scaling up of the war is also exposing these strategies um, in a, a, kind of putting a lot more, a, a much more intense spotlight on them um, and uh, subjecting them to uh, kind of critical evaluations in, in, in politics. And so obviously this is specifically the ambiguities uh, in, in the theme of this conference between the EU and Russia. Um, and so I think, I, you know, I, I see this in, in all the different uh, presentations here. Uh, it applies to the level of, of countries, right, Moldova, not completely kind of going, you know, all, all out support for Ukraine. Um, I mean, the next panel, an ours memo on Azerbaijan, we'll talk a bit about this as well. 
Um, even the, the unrecognized uh, territories that um, are not under control of their countries like Transnistria, um, you know, even Transnistria is engaging in, in some kind of ambiguity here that maybe is, is somewhat novel uh, relative to kind of what it was doing as early as 2008. Um, at the level of political parties that uh, Zhuzhas and, and Christina's uh, presentation uh, and, and brief talks about. So those representing the Russophones in, in the Baltics. Um, so, you know, maybe in the past they had, I mean, I'll talk about that a little bit more than in a minute, but also like, um, uh, you know, Dodon, who you mentioned in, uh, in, in uh, uh, who Magdalena mentioned in, in Moldova is also kind of not completely going all in uh, Russia and in general engages them much more. I mean, he's a complex figure. This is very interesting. <laughs> Uh, in terms of how he navigates all of this, um, having relative been previously pro EU. <laughs> um, and um, at the level of institutions, I thought what Juja and Christina mentioned about the Orthodox churches in the Baltics was interesting, right? So they're not kind of completely adopting the patriarch's own line, but not kind of siding the other way as well. And um, even at the level of, of projects like that, uh, that Joan mentions in hers, these cross border projects that are kind of localized and that seek to carve out an apolitical space. Um, and uh, I think Joan's uh, uh, analysis, uh, preliminary as it is, really interesting, um, you know, shows that they're not entirely apolitical, at least in the way that they're used um, you know, by the uh, Russian government. Uh, but they too get caught up in the war and kind of uh, you know, attention spotlight gets uh, put on them and um, they come under question, right? We get uh, the, the project sort of suspended on one hand, but on the other hand, they can kind of continue under the, under the radar without extra money being put in, if I understood correctly what was going on. Um, and so the, the picture overall seems to be that so far, um, most of these entities at different levels um, seem to be seeking to sustain this ambiguity, right? That even this radical scaling up of, the, of an invasion has not kind of forced a, a, a clean crystallization kind of break between you know, two sides, that there's still, uh, lots of interests that, um, you know, despite everything, um, you know, lead different entities to try and sort of have it both ways, uh, one way or the other, or, you know, maybe sort of morally support Ukraine, but protect their own interests um, on which they have, you know, vital dependence of various kinds. Um, the exception may be the, uh, at least in, in what's been discussed in this panel, the, the Russophone represented parties in the politics that, uh, 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 Susan and Christina mentioned. So I think that's interesting, right? That they've kind of seemed to have gone pretty far uh, in um, uh, sort of taking the, uh, the, the Ukrainian slash uh, European side, what the European Union side. Um, I mean, not to mention, of course, Ukraine, which is the one that was actually attacked. Um, there you have very fierce resistance. Um, uh, but um, so I guess kind of like the general questions for discussion and maybe other people would, would come up with others related to this, but you know, just what are the limits then of the strategic ambiguity, you know, until what kind of developments is this sustainable? Um, you know, there have been talk, for example, of uh, secondary sanctions that could be applied by the United States on countries that do business with sanctioned entities. Um, so, you know, would this end up forcing more to choose sides. Um, so I'm not saying choosing sides you know, is necessarily um, uh, you know, good or bad for the countries involved, um, but I just wonder like, you know, what, what will it take, I mean, meaning that I, I, you know, it's unclear which direction the country should go put in this uh, situation, like if they were forced to choose. And so that's kind of a secondary question, of, like screws really were put on in different ways. Um, you know, could these countries be tipped in one way uh, or the other? Um, and uh, I guess I just also wondered, you know, to some degree, um, you know, what about the active efforts by, um, you know, the e U.S. and EU, um, but also to the extent that they exist active efforts by Ukraine um, to, you know, force a resolution uh, of this ambiguity in favor um, of, of the kind of pro-Ukraine side in this conflict? Um, you know, are there such efforts? How, how effective are these? Um, so another uh, large overarching question that uh, uh, just uh, that I thought might be interesting to discuss in the context of these uh, uh, briefs and presentations um, is that, 
you know, there's a widespread view of Russia as the general threat to sort of state and nation building in the post-Soviet space, right? In what in the territories that it considers its its neighborhood. And so this would involve everything from sort of manipulation of and claims made on Russophone bone populations in the Baltics, uh, you know, troops in Transnistria and so on. And so kind of a, a general question would be, um, you know, would a significant reduction in uh, Russia's ability to um, engage in meddling and pressuring in, in these other countries around it, um, which could potentially be conceivable if Russia were to decisively, um, you know, lose this, this war, um, generate a, a trend towards stronger nation building or, or state building among the post-Soviet states, um, such as maybe the reduced, you know, would this possibly lead to a, redu a reduction in the securitization of Russophones in the Baltics if sort of the, 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 the big kin state were weakened sufficiently that maybe it were seen as less of a threat. Um, uh, also, um, you know, would there also maybe be fewer constraints for efforts to restore territorial integrity in cases like Moldova, Azerbaijan, or Georgia. And so, you know, I wonder to kind of remove the 14th Army and you know, what happens in Moldova. Um, I mean, I, I don't think the answer there is like clear for uh, lots of reasons, but I'd be interested uh, in your thoughts. So just finally, maybe just a question or two for each of the papers. Um, and so for Zhuzha and Christina, um, I, I guess just reading the memo, uh, the, the, the brief, my, my main question was kind of where, where do Russophones get their information about the war? Um, uh, and so how exposed are they to sort of the, the Russian line and to Russian propaganda? Um, and uh, you know, what, what maybe can you tell us about that? Because that, that seems to be an important piece that, um, you know, that kind of informs a lot of how Russian parties or, or kind of the, the Russophone representing parties would be positioning themselves uh, domestically. Um, and so for, for Joan, um, uh, I, I think um, my, I, my question was uh, that, you know, whether, you know, did the Russian media cover the European Commission's suspension of these programs? And if so, how did it cover it? Um, or did this all kind of in the end just get overwhelmed by the coverage of the war? Was this, is this, has this come up, uh, you know, on, on, in sort of the Russian uh, media space? Uh, such as it is. Um, and uh, in general, I mean, I think your findings are interesting in, in that it, you know, it, it uh, uh, you know, it, thinking about kind of the Russian context, it seems to fit this idea of sort of informational autocracy, whereby a lot can be allowed so long as it is spun in ways that benefits uh, the regime uh, at the local level. But even now we see this, you know, even, even these local level projects that would seem to benefit uh, uh, both sides uh, kind of cast uh, to the wayside. Um, and then finally for uh, Magdalena, um, I, I guess just, uh, it, you know, it struck me that uh, your brief mentions Romania only once and in passing. And that led me to think, you know, how, how, yeah, yeah. <laughs> how has it reacted? Um, you know, many in Moldova, but you know, I understand it also in Transnistria hold Romanian passports, or at least, you know, kind of see that as, as an outlet. Um, so I just wonder kind of, what the you know what you might say about the Romania factor. Um, so I will end it with that and look forward to the rest of the discussion. Great, thanks, thanks very much. And I also want to invite uh, questions and comments from the audience, including our virtual audience. So uh, Sarah can let me know if there are questions from the virtual audience. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, yep, so we have one question over here. Do we have a microphone today or do we? Aha, Sasha's got, okay. So. All right, so great. I've got three three audience questions already. I see four. Excellent, excellent. So so I'm going. I'm going to take a completely different approach to yesterday, and I'm going to take a bunch of questions and not let our speakers speak for a little while. <laughs> <laughs> so first year, and again, please introduce yourself um, and then ask your question. Thanks. Uh, good morning, Martin Yushek, uh, originally from Masaryk University, Czech Republic, now Fulbright visiting scholar here at the department. Uh, thank you for your presentations. Uh, my question is for uh, Professor Debinska. Uh, I'm personally focused on energy security and geopolitics, so I was happy to see and hear your presentation on, on Moldova, uh, which is a very interesting case, uh, not just in terms of energy security and how it is entangled with, with geopolitics in that part of Europe. Uh, I would be curious because uh, you mentioned that uh, the, the discourse within the politics 
uh, has seen some changes uh, in relation to uh, the change in the presidential palace, uh, which is, by the way, a very, very interesting building in, in Kisinau uh, in terms of the, of the politics there. Um, so I'm, I'm, I was wondering whether you also look deeper into history and how uh, the discourse changed uh, in relation to uh, energy supplies from Russia, because we've seen some changes in the past since 2011, when Moldova presented its will to join the European Union. Uh, since then, they were they were the their appeals to prolong the long term contract were rejected. After Dodon was elected, they got a, a new a new uh, mid term or long term slash long term uh, contract now with Maya Sandu. It's also a different, uh, different story. So I was wondering if you, if you had a chance to to compare uh, what was happening in the past couple of years with what was happening in uh, uh, early to, uh, 2000 and, and after 2010, and how it relates to to uh, the relations with uh, with Russia. Thank you. And I think um, Olena next, and then let's see. And I've got I've got Anar, and I don't know your name, but you're after that. And then Mark. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Olena Nikolenka, Fulham University. Yeah, I had a similar question to what uh, Henry had asked about the media consumption for Christina. Um, and um, uh, I wonder, uh, I assume that most uh, Russophone minorities uh, in the Baltics uh, consume primarily Russian language media. I'm not sure to what extent they're really fluent in Latvian or Estonian. So I wonder if uh, uh, they, uh, whether you asked uh, in the public opinion polls that you have seen um, to what extent they consume uh, uh, Russian language media produced in Russia, like, I don't know, Baldos, Russia, or Peru Canal, whatever, or uh, Russian language media that is actually produced in the Baltics, because Mendoza, you know, for example, is based in the Baltics, and it's obviously very critical of the regime. So do they um, really... Um, you know, uh, tend to gravitate to Russian language oppositional or independent media or Russian language media based in Russia. I think it makes a big difference. And a question for Magdalena about uh, a split in Moldova. I wonder to what extent it arises from different migration patterns, because uh, as far as I understand that some people in Moldova uh, go and work in Romania and others uh, seek employment in uh, Russia. So is it uh, a product of this <laughs> different migration patterns? And so then with an economic decline in Russia, I assume that fewer migrants would uh, be um, 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 would be moving to Russia um, just because of uh, the shrinking economy and uh, would it have then a positive impact on pro-European uh, sentiments in Moldova. And just as a footnote, it's interesting that the Ukrainian media does not really play up the fact that there is an ethnic minority in uh, Ukrainian, um, a lot of ethnic Ukrainians in uh, Transnistria. I, I haven't uh, you know, heard it on the Ukrainian media and uh, um, in the context of the ongoing war, what Ukrainian journalists usually bring up is how uh, the uh, military station in Transnistria has very weak uh, capabilities, and the, Russia, the Ukrainian armed forces should not worry too much about it. <laughs> Thank you. Now we have the gentleman in the front up here. I'm Peter Humphrey, an intelligence analyst and a former diplomat. I'm wondering if uh, we can talk a little bit about uh, Russians giving out passports. Uh, to citizens of, of the Baltics and, of course, even Moldova. Uh, are these countries recognizing dual citizenships when their citizens are suddenly getting these Russian passports? Is that a problem? And secondarily, uh, Russian Orthodox in Kazakhstan are quietly appalled by the behavior of their co-religionists um, in the military in Russia. And I'm wondering if that phenomenon extends to Russian Orthodox churches uh, in the Baltics and maybe even in Moldova. Is there a schism uh, with Kirill in these overseas Russian Orthodox, uh, uh, what's the correct word? 
It's uh, there's a there's a religious word. All right, thank you. I have Anar, Mark, and Milana, and then we'll cut off this round of questioning so that our speakers won't have forgotten all of the questions that we've collected. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, Anar Bali from Bakr Azerbaijan. I have a question for Dr. Kalas. Uh, the question is that 46% of the uh, people who are swinging don't know what exactly whether to support and the Russian support or pro-Ukrainian support is pretty much large. I just wondering whether you know any information. Are they swinging because they are feared to fully express their uh, sympathies toward the pro-Putin's pro actions over there, or they are reassessing the uh, the understanding of the current Russia? So will they behave differently if Putin wins Ukraine? Will this 46% swing to become a pro-Putin or they're reassessing that what Putin is doing something wrong? So if you have a kind of answer for this question, thank you. Thanks. Now over to Mark. Thank you. Um, my, my question also is, picks up on Henry's point about the media uh, and what people are looking at or listening to. And um, in Latvia, one of my cousins, I spoke with a couple of weeks ago, said that she and uh, a good friend of hers who is a Russophone, an ethnic Russian, um, they had quite a sharp split because she is listening, that, that is the, the friend is listening to or watching um, you know, the Russian television actually, not even something within Latvia, but we're watching Russian television. And, um, but they had been very friendly, but now they've had a very sharp split over the war. And I'm wondering, do you, have you picked up on the extent to which this, um, the war has affected personal relations between Latvian speakers and, uh, and Russophone speakers and, and people who speak both as my cousins do? I, I should add that um, my father-in-law in Bulgaria watches Russian television quite a bit. And um, I've been a very sensible person, except on things pertaining to Russia, um, where he tends to echo the Russian line, even though he is in a country in which you can very easily um, learn about what is actually going on. He often will repeat uh, Kremlin propaganda. Finally, over to Malata in the back. Thank you. Thank you for all of these great presentations. My question is for Christina and Andrea. I'm just wondering whether you see in the future the likelihood of um, contestation among Russian speakers in these countries, meaning different political parties vying sort of a progressive Russian speakers versus more pro-Russian Russian speakers, whether that actually that kind of competition might even lead to more participation. I think we saw that somewhat in Slovakia, although then it wasn't necessarily a successful project, but we had this moment where the Hungarian minority vote was split between the kind of traditional nationalist and progressive parties. All right, we have lots of great questions for our panelists to chew on. We'll, uh, and we'll give you a chance to respond to some of them, all of them, in whatever order you so choose, um, in the same order as the presentation. So, Judah and Christina. Thank you very much for really excellent big questions that are difficult <laughs> to answer. So, uh, and thank you for Henry's big question about ambiguity. So, um, I agree that this is an underlying theme that war um, compels everyone to simplify and, um, and to take stands, sharp, clear stands. And uh, the problem, of course, is that if when war become, becomes uh, normalized and protracted, uh, then ambiguity will come back, we'll have to come back, especially um, on, on the local level, right? Because people live where they live on the local level, in local settings. And uh, this also came out from discussions, presentations yesterday, that that local level is where people can have 
agency a lot more usually typically and um and so it matters in this numbers matter when we talk about minority populations and majority populations numbers and places demographic concentration all of this matters in the case of the baltic uh, countries we are talking about very small populations so let's not lose sight of that, that Estonia has a population of about 1.3 million, that Latvia has a population about, of about 1.9 million, I think, Lithuania about 2.6 million. These are very small populations. And so when we are talking about uh, majority-minority relations, these are small nations, uh, small languages, and um, there is a term used in security studies that we have kind of embraced in our, in our more comparative work on, on the securitization of minorities, which is ontological security. Um, and ontological security, which initially was used uh, for analysis at the individual level, but it's also used for analysis of collective action because that's, that's what politics does, is collective action of some kind, right? Either through representation or going out on the street to demonstrate or ad, ad hoc and all that, but it is about collective action. And ontological security is very relevant um, for in, in the context of nation building. And so for Estonians, ontological security means that they are protecting a small language of a very small population in which there is about a third of, of Rus Russian speakers. And of course, uh, statistics, uh, census data usually collects data about ethnicity, which is smaller, a smaller cluster than, than, than the speakers of the language. And so anyway, so I'd like to put that up there because it's very, very important. And then within those small populations, it matters that usually, first and second generation people concentrate in the large cities, not only in, in Latvia and Estonia, but that's just the logic of, of migration typically. And so when the capital city sounds like it's pretty Russian or too Russian, right? Because 60% of Estonia's Russian speakers are in, in, in Tallinn, for example. And, and, and Riga, first of all, a third of Latvia's population lives in Riga, <laughs> and uh, and about forty some percent are Russian speakers, and so it's usually in the context of the nation building nation state model, ontological security becomes even more heightened when you're talking about the capital city, the center of the state, where the nation is supposed is usually typically trying to assert ownership. And so it matters that in Estonia, um, the largest concentration of Russian speakers is still, although in absolute numbers, they are more numerous in, the, in Tallinn, they're in, along the Russian border in this Northeast region where that's a Russian speaking dominant region. And in that region, um, for various reasons, reasons that I'm not gonna have time to, to, to uh, uh, lay out now, but the Estonian government decided in nine, as early as 1993 to allow non-residents uh, to vote in local elections. Non-citizens, non I'm sorry, non-citizens, yes. To vote in local elections. And so they couldn't run for office, but that allowed one mainstream party to capture Russophone votes at the local level and build a mainstream party that everyone knew was kind of a Russian party, but still it allowed um, Russian speakers possibilities to build some agency at the local level. Latvians did not do that. They were not compelled to do it. And Latvia became way more divided and that shows up everywhere, because still. And so that goes back to uh, Milada's question about parties, that there is obviously intra-minority pluralism, as in everywhere, but because minorities also need collective action, numbers matter, 
larger minorities that that um, have a chance to form two parties that might get into parliament because the threshold everywhere is five percent. Uh, so, for example, Hungarians in Romania are by far the largest minority, but the Romanian 5% does not make it possible for them to speak because then they have no chance to be at the table in Bucharest. Slovakia had the same issue that Hungarians thought that they could divide and show pluralism, but then they fell out of parliament because of, right? So in, in Estonia, Latvia, Estonia, Russophones, because of this early development of voting at the local level have been mostly sustaining center, but not entirely. And Christina will talk about that. So there is a possibility to go in different directions, but numbers and ratios matter a great deal. In Latvia, Russophones have, because they were felt more alienated from, from the state, from the establishment, they have been supporting harmony that brands itself as a, well, we are not a Russian party, but of course they are a Russian party, and everyone knows that. And Latvians decided to, let's see, marginalize them, isolate them in parliament. So they have no voice, really. So yeah, they can vote, but nothing they put forward gets uh, a chance. And so it is a fundamental question that has to do with numbers and places and concentration and the choices that majority actors make choices that majority actors make. And Estonians have made more accommodative choices after 19, uh, 2014, even though 2014 has become a huge issue, of course, in securitization, splits, inter-minority splits. When I was doing interviews in Estonia, Latvia in 2014 and afterwards, everyone talked about that, about you know, families not talking, members not talking to each other and all that. So of course, but the choices that the actors, political actors are making, make a big difference. And I'm gonna just stop there. <laughs> Give it to Christina. Um, uh, yes, uh, questions. I, I will ask some specific questions. Uh, I wanted to comment on Orthodox Church because really that's so far the only institution that has expressed strategic ambiguity regarding the war in Ukraine. Uh, because political parties or other actors either have not said anything or have been very univocally in for Ukraine. So it's, but Orthodox Church, what happened with Orthodox Church in Estonia is that they signed um, a joint statement by all confessions in Estonia condemning the war. But they argued to uh, take out the word of Russian aggression from that text. So they, they, um, they, they, they went for it condemning the war uh, but do not openly want to condemn and call it a Russian aggression in Ukraine. And uh, I watched carefully actually the interview with the um, um, with Evgeny, what's his primer, Evgeny, I think, who is under the um, uh, rule of Kirill, Patriarch Kirill. So he was, um, I could see his uncomfortable situation where he he as a as a Christian and as a you know human uh, human soul savior had to constantly repeat that war is something that we can never accept and as, as Christians. So for us it's completely unacceptable. But when the journalist was pushing him and saying that, but then the second sentence you have to follow this is that you also condemn the aggressor who started the war. And it was in Russian language TV, by the way. It was not on Estonian TV, it was on Russian media. And he constantly had to wiggle around. Of, of, of saying that, yes, we condemn the war and Russia is guilty at starting the war. Uh, and I understood eventually why he's doing that, because that would mean that he would, basically that's a split within the Orthodox Church. And he does not want to take responsibility of starting the, the, the split. So he has this uh, obligation to follow Kirill's uh, statements, but but as a Christian, he could not uh, actually support the war openly. So this, this is the kind of ambiguity that they have. And it's really very not easy position for the Orthodox Church. Um, now the question regarding the information that the Russian community gets. Well, the, the, the Estonia was the last country to ban the Russian TV channels. We did it, I think, on the morning of 25th of February. <laughs> so... Uh, uh, it took us a long time of discussion because of uh, um, kind of an approach to the freedom of speech and all these debates. We are democracy after all. So we had long years long debate about freedom of speech. 
uh, regarding the Russian channels, but when the war started, the decision was very swift and, and, and they were blocked uh, starting from the early hours of 24th of February, actually. Same morning, I think they did it, or it was next morning, anyway. Um, so that means that the Russian TV cannot be followed any longer on Estonian territory. Of course, they can do it through the YouTube, and that's, I think, what, what many of them still do. However, uh, I'm just open to, to check their recent polls uh, regarding the, it's not so much about what you watch, it's a question of what you trust, which information do you trust. They do watch Russian TV, but it doesn't mean that they, they watch it because of the news or that they trust the news. So they can watch it, they mostly watch it for entertainment purposes, and if there are in between of these entertainment programs, there are news programs, okay, they might watch it, but the main question is, do you trust the information that is coming from there? And it's interesting what has happened to the Russian um, speaking population is that the, the trust, the, the, the amount of people who still follow Russian media is the same. It has not changed uh, with blocking the channels. So they, they, they are watching it for the YouTube. But the trust has decreased. So the question, for example, uh, where do you, which sources of information do you trust regarding the war in Ukraine? Um, 39% of the Russians in Estonia said that they trust Estonian Russian language channels. Uh, and 27% said that they trust Russian language, Russian channels, Federation channels. 24% said that they trust Western European or Western channels. And actually 16% said that they also trust Ukrainian channels, uh, what Ukrainian channels are saying. So it's very diverse, as you see. And that's also the, the expression of diversity of Russian media consumption. I mean, it's it's a little bit myth that Russians watch only Russian TV. Russians in Baltic states have very diverse media consumption, much more diverse than the Estonian population. Estonian population watches Estonian national TV and that's what they trust, that's what they watch. Russians in the Baltic states watch Russian channels, Estonian channels, uh, Western channels, Ukrainian channels, Russian opposition channels, so that's all they do. So in this sense, it's much more diverse of things. And then and the last, uh, I asked the question regarding the passports, I can do it later maybe. The only, the only information is that there is a rather a threat, um, tendency of Russian Federation citizens actually changing to Estonian citizenship in recent, uh, in, in recent two months. Um, so, and the question regarding what those 46% of the Russians actually think, I don't know. I mean, I don't know, um, and uh, we need qualitative research for that to have a focus group discussions with them so that they could open up, but I think it's too early to do that. And, uh, and I think both of them are there represented, the people who are afraid to express their opinions and people who actually are confused about what to think. So. If you don't mind, I'd like to just add a few uh, words no. to about the media. I no. cannot. No. <laughs> okay. Technically, we only have five minutes left, oh, and sorry. Joan and Magdalena okay. haven't spoken, okay. although we'll go over a bit. Okay. Um, but uh, okay. but I want to give the floor first to Joan and then okay. to Magdalena. Sure. Joan! <laughs> <clears throat> okay, I'll be very brief because not many of the questions were addressed to me, but on this issue of ambiguity, um, in this case, uh, ostensibly, the ambiguity has declined, and this is because this is an EU program and the EU has taken a very clear position and I think intends to enforce that position. So um, one should also note that Poland um, previously had a small border traffic regime agreed um, under special approval from the EU that involved Kaliningrad Oblast and an extended area in Poland that lifted the visa requirement for people going back and forth. And that was already suspended in 2016. So this has been a progression. I guess the question for the, as I proceed with this research and whether I can derive this from the interviews, I'm not sure, is whether it's more ambiguous um, for the people who are actually participating in the projects. And here it would, will be interesting to see if there are Russian speaking participants on the Estonian and Latvian side in particular and what their viewpoints are in terms of this. And I, I think I may be able to get to that from those interviews. So that may be one of the most important things going forward. Um, a short comment on a couple of other matters. Um, my own view would be sanctions to reduce ambiguity. I don't know, I'd be interested in Magdalena's view, but kind of following what she said, it seems that, that actually more positive measures would be more appropriate to me rather than sanctions in cases like Moldova. But I pose that to, um, to Magdalena who's coming next. And on the question of whether um, what the Russian reaction was to the suspension, so far I haven't found much reaction at all. I have to dig a little bit deeper still into the 
into the local media, which is what's the only media that's really covered this to begin with. But my um, hypothesis or my expectation would be that it would be covered in the same way that the programs were covered. In other words, very minimally in a kind of a sanitized form, because of course, there are so many things being cut off now that this would be only a, a very minor, um, a minor element. And I just wanted to pose one question at the end, which probably may, there may not be time to answer, but to Christina, is there, is there a possibility that this um, Russian, Russian speaking population involvement in humanitarian aids, aid to Ukraine actually could be a nation building um, ex exercise for Estonia and Latvia? In other words, it's kind of a common endeavor and could um, raise the status of uh, or the visibility in a positive way of the Russian speaking contribu community contribution to the effort and still be relatively you know, safe in that it's, it's humanitarian aid. So I'll stop there and let Magdalena continue because she had a lot of questions. And then, yeah, Magdalena, take the time you need to answer the question. Okay, there's, I, I hope I noted all of them. Thank you very much for, 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 for the questions. Yes, um, I'll start with the, Ambiguity, Transnistria, and then move to Moldova. Um, uh, as I as I mentioned in in, in the brief, uh, Transnistria is certainly benefiting from the ambiguity and from the situation of being in between. That's uh, that that's for sure. The economic elites, I, I mean, and, and, and political elites at least. Uh, as for choosing for them, it would be uh, probably impossible to really have this uh, the autonomy to choose between Moldova Western world or Russia. Why? Because if, uh, they are completely dependent on, on Russia. So gas is one thing, but there's uh, uh, 66. Right now, I, I, I'm not sure of the numbers, but it's a huge chunk of the budget is actually financed by, by Russia. 60% uh, of some some uh, some years uh, pensions are paid by uh, by Russia passports are given by Russia etc cetera, etc cetera. so 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 the the economy actually is sustainable at some point because uh, Russia is uh, is injecting uh, money humanitarian aid uh, etc uh, uh, obviously since 2014 Russia cut these subsidies somehow because well, it was engaged otherwise. Um, and uh, and Transnistria still because because with the gas free of charge and then uh, exports to the West uh, still could somehow manage but but yes it was like a small uh, um, economic crisis within within uh, Transnistria still um, I would say also that re re concerning the the, the army. Uh, Russian army that is uh, in Transnistria, it's 1,500 people, uh, so it's not a huge amount of, of people. Obviously, if, if uh, well, Russia will not really kind of, uh, put out uh, these troops uh, from Transnistria, it didn't do it for years, and it was always asked to do it, uh, didn't do it. But what has to be mentioned that the Transnistria has its own army too. So, so it's uh, actually Transnistrian army is uh, is bigger than the Russian contingent that is on the soil, and the Russian contingent is are the peacekeepers, uh, and uh, and uh, and the army Russian army that is securing um, the biggest depot of arms in Europe in Kobasna, which is in the north of Transnistria, two kilometers from the Ukrainian border. Uh, just mentioned <laughs> security uh, issues there. Um, as for uh, as for Transnistria passports, Romania, and so so where Romania uh, is concerned in Transnistria, uh, one has to know that uh, Transnistrians are one third Ukrainian ethnic Ukrainians, one third. Ethnic Moldovans and one third ethnic Russians. They are all Russophones, and there is this nation building project that is on and is actually taking root of the people, multi ethnic people of Transnistrians. Uh, but the Moldovan schools and Ukrainian schools, 
actually there's very little incentives to go to Moldovan and, and uh, Ukrainian schools, and most of the pupil go to, uh, to, to Russian schools because of the then the social mobility that comes with, with uh, the Russian language, diplomas, etc. And also because the Moldovan schools, actually the Moldovan language is uh, taught um, with Cyrillic. And Moldova changed from Cyrillic to Latin alphabet. So actually the Moldovan language that is taught in, 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 in Transnistria does not exist anywhere else than <laughs> Transnistria. So, so it is a difficulty for, for them to come. And there's also the question of socialization. We talked about it a little bit yesterday. Um, for 30 years now, people, so two generations, are taught in Transnistria in, with a special narrative of history where Romanians were fascists and Romanians are the biggest enemy possible. And the Moldovan state too, state, not, not Moldovan people, but Romanians, that's something that is that's the, the biggest enemy of, of the um, of Transnistrians. So, so there, there's no, not many people that, uh, this is in 2007 when the Romania joined the EU, there was like this, oh, maybe that would bring a change in the conflict resolution because people, they will see the Transnistrians, will seduce them through the Romanian passports, etc. It didn't happen. Uh, it just didn't happen. Uh, so uh, most people in, Moldova, in, in Transnistria have all sorts of passports, the Transnistrian passports, that well, you don't go far with a Transnistrian passport. <laughs> so they have Russian, Ukrainian, uh, Moldovan passports, often all of them, uh, and they jungle like this, <laughs> crossing the borders, I've seen that. Uh, um, so, uh, so, so for Transnistria, for Transnistrians, Romania, it's not, not an, attractive, uh, um, an, attract, an attractive direction. For Moldovans, yes, much more. And, um, uh, and even uh, we've seen a jump in, in, in support for the reunification with, of Moldova with Romania um during the pandemic because of the crisis etc so it was uh, it, and, and even now there is some some portion of, of th those people that that want to join the eu uh some of them would like the strategy of the shortcut so let's reunite with romania and thus we will be in in uh, in, uh, in the eu in romania however the support for reunification dropped so so they don't align much, uh, and 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 even and even uh, we talk about like twenty five percent of Moldovans that would eventually join uh, uh, Romania, but you still have the majority of the people that 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 want to Moldova independent Moldova, and that is this in between, and this is where I'm going to speak of the, the split. So just imagine that Moldova. Uh, signed the association agreements with the EU, uh, signed the DCFTA, uh, but at the same time, since 2017, it also has a status of observer uh, in the Eur Eurasian Union. And this reflects, really, this reflects Moldova and its, and its uh, recent history, uh, and it's symptomatic of, of this division and it is in between all the time. So, even between 2016 and 2020, you had uh, the pro-European uh, government and pro-Russian president. Then in 2020, that aligned. And this is the moment, maybe the opportunity that is really uh, the moment where, where positive measures <laughs> and not sanctions uh, might play into the EU turn of, of of, uh, of, of Moldova, but uh, as I mentioned, it's, the support is really fragile for this, uh, this uh, the, gov the government, etc. especially with the, all the, possible, uh, the crisis that comes with the pandemic, with the refugees, and now possibly the energy crisis. So, so, uh, so it's, it will be very difficult. And something that I did not mention, why Moldova is fascinating, because it has also an territorial autonomy within Moldova of Gagauz people, mm -hmm. and the Gagauz people are also 
uh, very pro-Russian in 2014, they did a referendum, 97% of Gagao's people uh, wanted uh, to join Russia uh, at that time in 2014. So, so you have within Moldova also, there's not only Transnistria, but there's Gagao's people uh, too that are, real, that, are um, that, that believe that they are part of the Ruski me. Uh, so, uh, so that's another pull and push there that 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 you have, um, and then that, that brings me to, to the question of um, migrants and economic uh, mi migration. Actually, uh, uh, the proportion of people um, economic migration going to Russia versus uh, Europe changed more or less in 2016. Uh, uh, there's more Moldovans going to Europe. Then Moldova is going to Russia, uh, and then the remittances and, and, and all that. So, so it does not. We could think that that would change the public opinion within Moldova, but you don't see the the alignment. And actually, when you when you look the polls since 2010, etc., when you look the polls, uh, pro and pro EU versus pro Russia, it's always like oh, this. The majority now for pro euro and majority now from for Russia and it's really really uh, all the time balancing like that. Uh, so um, going to the last point, yes, I think uh, um, to to uh, the media, trusty media, another uh, in 2019, I think the last post I've seen on the trusty media uh, uh, again half half. Uh, you have like 50% of people that trust the, the European media and 50% uh, trust Russian media. Mm -hmm. and go figure. Uh, and the energy, um, uh, so energy is a, is a, is a, lever, it's a, a leverage for Russia, obviously, and it plays this card. So um, when the, uh, the government is too much pro-Western government, then pay me the debt, the debt that I was talking about, because Transnistria, uh, how it works, Transnistria uh, consume, uh, consumes two thirds of the gas that is brought from Russia to Moldova, but Transnistria does not pay to Moldova gas for this, for this gas. Meaning that uh, there's some seven right now. I think it's like seven or eight eight billion US dollars that Moldova owes to Gazprom. Uh, uh, so so this this is the debt is there because Transnistria does not pay and has gas free of charge. Uh, but the debt is of Moldova gas and not of Transnistria because Moldova does not recognize the independence of. Etc. So, so right now, for example, this is this is what um, uh, what's happening. Russia is playing the, uh, the the this card of of debt that Moldova needs to pay, but obviously that's a huge amount of of, of money. Uh, one thing that that's changed, I think, in the energy energy security for Moldova is that uh, it's it did start to look into the diversification of uh, sources uh, coming of, of, of energy and uh, um, I mentioned it in the brief but not not uh, not on the presentation um, right now Moldova has the possibility to turn to actually uh, to peak pipelines that come uh, by through Romania from Romania by reversed gas uh, and also is already importing some something like the liquefied gas from Poland, uh, but it's uh, it's 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 nothing nothing that that will sustain Moldova at all. Uh, the problem is that having gas from from um, uh, from Russia is cheaper, much cheaper than gas that would come from market prices uh, through Moldova or uh, through Russia, uh, Romania. <laughs> or other so so and the differences of prices are just huge so it's not sustainable if Moldova is not helped actually from outside all right thank you so much thank you for a fascinating panel